Well, good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to what will hopefully be the first of many ARC Talks, where ARC stands for Athletics, Race, and Christianity. So here, here at Baylor University, it's our hope and ambition to be beacons of the good news of Jesus Christ in every sphere of human life. And so this conversation that, that, that we're going to have tonight is part and parcel of that, of that mission. Now, these talks, however, are going to have a particular purpose. In the last few months, there, there, there have been a number of conversations, particularly about racial justice. Uh, chances are, if you're, if you're watching this webinar, this, this, this isn't your first webinar on racial issues. But, but I'm deeply convinced that there are really only two types of conversations that matter, conversations about assumptions and conversations about methods. If our assumptions are clear, then we can avoid misunderstanding and speaking past one another. And if we agree on the problem that needs to be solved, then we can talk methods and perhaps come to the point of realizing that there may be multiple different ways to achieve the same goal. And so in these, in these ARC talks, it's our, it's our hope to gather scholars, ministers, and athletes to reflect on the intersections between race, sports, and Christianity, but not to stop at reflection. Our hope is for continual integration, that the faith is never separate from our worldly endeavors, but rather that it's that it's into that it's intimately interwoven in everything that we do. And so for each of our panelists, that might that might look a little different. So I'm looking, so I'm looking forward to where we to where we end up going this this evening. So first, uh, a few a few acknowledgments. First of all, to uh to, ba to Baylor's president, Dr. Dr. Linda Livingstone for her for her visionary leadership of the university. Uh, to Baylor Athletics, to Athletic Director Mac, Mac Rhodes, to Marcus Sedberry, and to Katie Smith, who have been helpful in getting this in getting this up off the ground, and also to Truett, to Truett Seminary, its Dean Todd Still, uh, and folks in the Faith and Sports in Institute, John White, Paul Putz, uh, and Maxi Blaylock for helping us with with a lot of our marketing materials. So, with that, uh, it's. It's probably important that I introduce myself. So my name, so my name is Malcolm Foley. I'm special advisor to Baylor's president for equity and campus engagement, as well as the director of the Black Church Studies program at Truett Seminary. Uh, and I would like to introduce my co-moderator, uh, John, John, John Maurer, uh, associate chaplain and director of sports ministry for, for, for Baylor Athletics, uh, to pray for us briefly as we get, and, and, then, and, and then we'll get the party started. John, please. Thank you, Malcolm. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity tonight to gather, to have this conversation about faith, race, and sport. Um, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be present in each and every one of us, Lord, as we speak. It would uh, edify all that are here, that it would challenge, Lord, that you would, yeah, that you would help us to, uh, to get to know one another better and the issues that are, that are there. Lord, thank you for this panelist that you have provided for us tonight. Lord, thank you for the technology. Uh, that we can all be all over the country and, and take part of this time. Lord, we're excited to see what uh, you have for us in this conversation and the, the next steps that we can take after this conversation, Lord, to put our faith into action uh, in, a, in a place, in a, in a world that is so necessary right now. So, Lord, we thank you and pray your blessing on this time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, with that, let me take some time to introduce our panelists. So first of all, Sam, Sam Acho. Sam Acho is a, is a writer, speaker, and public humanitarian and football player, a graduate of the University of Texas and the Thunderbird School of Global Management. In 2010, he received the Campbell Trophy, awarded to a college football player who combines academic success, football performance, and exemplary leadership, as well as the, as well as the Warfel tro Trophy, college football's premier award for community service. He spent nine seasons in the NFL and was a finalist for, for, the, for the NFL's Walter Payton Man of the Year Award in 2017. He currently serves as the founder and president of Athletes for Justice and as a, and as a vice president for the, for the NFL Players Association. His first book, Let the World See You, How to Be Real in a World of Fakes, it was was published in 2020, and he also recently launched the Athletes for Justice podcast, which which engages questions similar to those which we'll deal with tonight. Thanks for thanks for being with us, Sam. We also have Simone Charlie. Simone plays forward for the for the Portland Thorns in the National Women's Soccer League. She's she's a graduate of Vanderbilt University, where she starred in multiple sports, earning first team All Conference honors in soccer and first team All American honors in the triple jump. She double majored in, in psychology and sociology at Vanderbilt 
and also received a, a master's degree in medicine, health, and society. After her, soccer, after her soccer career is over, she plans to continue her education and pursue a career path in clinical psychology. Wonderful to have you, Simone. We've also got Esau McCauley. Esau is an is assistant professor of, of, of New Testament at, 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 at Wheaton College. His research and writing focus on Pauline theology, African-American biblical interpretation, and articulating a Christian theology of justice in the public square. His most recent book, Reading While Black, African-American biblical interpretation as an exercise in hope, was named Christianity Today's Beautiful Orthodoxy Book of the Year. It's a, it's, it's a great one. Everyone should pick it up. Uh, he also he also received the, the 2020 Emerging Public Intellectual Award and is a and is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. But before embarking on his accomplished career as a scholar and author, Macaulay was also a student athlete playing football for Sewanee from 1998 to 2001. Good to have you, Esau. And last but certainly not least, we have Danny Price. Danny Price is an is an assistant softball coach for Georgia Southern University. She was a student athlete at McNeese State, competing on the softball team from 2008 to 2012 before graduating with a degree in health and, and human performance. She went on to get her, her, her Master of Divinity degree with a sports ministry concentration from Baylor University's Truett Theological Seminary. And during that time, she also worked with the Baylor softball team, serving as a volunteer assistant coach for the, for, for three seasons from 2015 to 2017. And following her time at Baylor, she served as an assistant coach with McNeese State before joining the staff at Georgia Southern where she's beginning her second season. Thank you for joining us, Danny. Well, let's get the, let's get the party started. I wanna start, I wanna start with just kind of a, just a, a softball question um, as in just, 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 just right down the middle, easy key moment from the last from the last few years, uh, that's that that's caused you to reflect a little bit more about particularly the intersection between race and sports. Has, has there been anything over the course of the last few years that's that's pushed that in your in your mind? Sam, you want to start? Well, I wish you would have started with the football question, not a softball question. I feel like Danny was was more is more equipped to handle handle those. I think the moment for me was the 2017 season early that year we were playing I was played for the Chicago Bears the Arizona Cardinals and uh, and also the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and and that was the time when the year before Colin Kaepernick had been taking a knee protesting uh, social injustice um, he had made statements to the effect of I can't sit here and watch black people being killed by the police and not say something or do something and at that time he was, he was demonized. He was, uh, he seemed like a villain in a lot of ways, but then actually went back and I watched the interview and I, and I listened to his words and I said, Oh, wow, he's, he's right. But it just seemed like no one saw it that way. So fast forward, he took a knee that year and early in the 2017 season, uh, there was obviously political kind of there was a political charge and, and, uh, the, the president at the time had made some statements about football players, NFL players, uh, and, and, how they should be treated if they take a knee, if they were, were to take a knee. And I just remember our entire locker room, the entire league, were, we were up in arms. We were frustrated. We were angry. We were upset. We wanted to do something. And it seemed like no one knew what to do. And, and for me, that was a time where a lot of my teammates and coaches and staff looked to me, though I wasn't a captain of the team. Uh, I've been on the team for some years. They said, Sam, what are we going to do? It was at that, it was at that point that I realized that this conversation about injustice, about race, about America and sport, it, 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 it all intersects. And so that was probably the, 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 the key moment when I realized that something has to be done. Thanks, Sam. See, I, asking a softball question, I should have gone to the softball coach first, but <laughs> that's all right. That's, 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 my, that's my bad. Danny? Danny, could you could you could could you let us know a moment a moment from the last few years that caused you to that caused you to think a little more about about the intersection between race and sport? Yeah, absolutely. I think very similar to Sam, um, when Colin Kaepernick knelt, it just that was when I began to be curious um, because I didn't understand. I didn't understand um, why there was kneeling. I didn't understand his initial interviews. I didn't understand. 
um, the chaos surrounding surrounding it. And so I think I just began being curious and and kind of to Sam's point, listening to the words he was saying and listening to the conversations that were taking place. And I think in my mind, that's where I first went to, okay, these are image bearers of God. Like every one of us are created in the image of God and they're worth listening to and their voice matters. And so I just, I don't even think I began understanding. I just began listening at that point. And I think um, the best thing that I was able to do was I was just curious. Um, and so that's kind of when the, the, that's when it started for me in that sense. And then I would say most recently when I, when I really felt um, like a change in me was probably when I watched the videos of Am Ahmaud Arbery. Um, and that's when it kind of reignited in my, in my soul to really say, okay, this is not, this is not okay. And, and what can I do? So those two crucial moments were, were mine. Thanks, Danny. Simone? I was going to say, is it, is it too soon to talk about 2020? Are we, yeah, are we there yet? <laughs> um, yeah, I would say 2020 was quite the year. Um, obviously, with like what Danny was saying with Ahmaud Arbery, with Breonna Taylor, with George Floyd, um, at least for us, it forced a lot of people on our team to look racism in the face in a way that they hadn't before. And I remember that week in particular um, when the videos of George Floyd came out and there was tension at training. And it was, are we gonna have these conversations or are we gonna just pretend that we didn't see anything on Twitter and just continue on with our lives? And I remember the first couple of days, there was just this tension there until finally we were like, no, we gotta, we gotta talk about this because we're just ignoring the issue at this point. And it was definitely challenging because as a team, we had to sit down and just start talking about our experiences. And, you know, a lot of times, like you're, the sport that you play, it's almost like an escape. It's like, okay, my real life is outside of here, but just for these two hours a day, I'm gonna play soccer and not think about this. But it's like, no, because this is my life. I'm, I'm a black woman 24 hours out of the day, whether or not I'm playing soccer two of those hours. And so it was definitely interesting in that, like for us as a team, we started listening to podcasts every week. And then we'd have a team discussion about, about it at the end of the week and then started reading articles and things like that. And the conversation about kneeling for the anthem came up and what we wanted to do about it and whether or not we wanted to be unified as a team on whether or not we're gonna stand or kneel. And I just remember having those conversations and hearing people's perspective. And I think 2020 was interesting in that people were willing to listen in a way that I feel like people weren't willing to listen before. And people were willing to believe your experience in a way that they weren't before. And so I think last year was an, a sad but powerful year in that um, I think there's more of a willingness to talk about these issues because that's the only way that we can actually take steps towards justice. Thanks, Simone. Esau. Yeah, I mean, I listen to a lot of sports podcasts and those kinds of things. And it's often been my way of escaping from this highly political racialized world. That's kind of one of the things that I used to do. And I remember kind of going back to Colin Kaepernick and before that, that era. So forgive me, this is not an event, but it was a mood that I saw switch. And it wasn't the fact that politics entered sports. I mean, politics has always been a part of sports, but the fact that it was seen that like these black athletes need to be grateful and both football and in basketball in particular. And like in the fact that the politicians, especially the, the former president saw it as, a, as a good way to rally the troops or rally the base, which is to say, look at these black athletes who are being ungrateful for the things that they had. And I just remember um, like the shut up and dribble comment and those things and this whole idea that, that black people should be grateful for what they have was to me like a strangely evocative 
like language going back to an early era in our history, which, which caused me to look into the history of black activism. And you see that both publicly and the athletes have always played a role in contending for justice. And to be honest, they often also funded a lot of their work. So it's been black athletes and black entertainers who have been both the economic and the public face of advocacy. And so in some sense, the, the present moment, broadly speaking over the last four years, reignited or brought to the fore this historic role. And so for me, it made me appreciate that it's not just that this current generation is more than an athlete, but you can go to Jesse Owens, to Muhammad Ali, to Jackie Robinson, to Hank Aaron. That they were, we always had more to say, even Bill Russell or in modern day Kareem Abdul Jabbar. There's always been a sense in which um, African American athletes have been engaged in contending for justice in the public square. And that's an important point you saw. Uh, when, when, when we have conversations, particularly about race, whether we're talking about the intersection between race and sport or any other intersection, what we're talking about, what we're talking about is uh, a social, a, a social and political construct. And so, and so, and, and so, and so we're necessarily going to be asking these questions of political engagement um, and of, and of, and of deep social engagement. And so, and so we've, we, we've seen this intersection between, between, between race and sports before. Um, but but how so 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 and this is and this is one of the things that we're that we're that we're trying to deal with in these in these talks how does the how does how does our faith actually 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 inform those connections as well so as you've as you've thought about not just race and sport but also thinking about how your how your faith how your how your faith is integrated into the, into this conversation as well where where have you found uh, helpful, helpful people, helpful resources in helping you process and reflect on those on those connections, particularly the connections between race and your and your faith. As you, if you're if you're an athlete, as you as you as you do your as you do your sport, um, but also for Esau, I mean, it it plays into your scholarship. Um, where where have you found helpful help, help, helpful resources, helpful people? I mean, this might be. Forgive me for being the New Testament scholar and and going full Jesus too early in the, in, in the <laughs> interview, but really, it's historically um, African Americans have found hope in in the scriptures, and so when we look, when I look, when I take what's going on in America, and I see the disinherited people stepped on, and I say, well, then how does God feel about this? And I open up the Bible and I see and I open up the Psalms and says, God, the, you know, defender of the war, defender of the poor and, and the widows and the orphans. And because no one else will arise, I will arise and help them, says the Lord Almighty. And so, like, actually in the Psalms, for example, I see a God who who, who has a, a hunger and a thirst for justice. So on one level, I would say the Bible is, is like my constant companion. But the other thing that I've also found helpful is actually engaging people who have much different beliefs than I do. So when I read about people outside of the Christian faith talking about justice, I begin to understand the scope of the problems. So it keeps me from just kind of sliding into my holy huddle and saying, you know, Jesus take the wheel. I need to be able to learn how to actually answer the questions that are being posed to me by the culture. And so listening to secular people or people who don't share my beliefs, but are also contending for a more just society, seeing the kinds of questions that they ask and the kind of answers they pose have helped me try to think, okay, I now know what the, what the Christian faith has to address. And sometimes you have to actually go outside of the church to hear how people are actually talking about racial injustice. So I know how the church needs to respond. No, that's good. I think it's I think it's important, especially for us as Christians operating in the world that we that we don't that when we enter into relationships with people, we're not entering into those relationships saying, "Hey, I know everything that's going on with you. I have the answer to it." It's it it, it ought to be a humble it ought to be a humble seeking of, "Hey, what's going on? What's what what's going on? What are you what are you going through?" And then I have to do the work of thinking through, "Well, how how is Jesus the answer to that?" Uh, we we come we come knowing that Jesus is the answer, but we don't. But 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 that but that actual hard work of thinking through. Okay, well, how how is that true? I mean, that's what that's a, that that's essentially what the Christian life is all is all about. Uh, Simone, what your thoughts? Things that have been helpful for you? Yeah, um, I would say for me, just relying on my community. Um, 
just through my church there I have a, a lot of couple or a couple close friends that when all of this was happening those were the first people that I called and relied on them just to to vent about my experience about everything that I'm going through and I think to Esau's point it's very important that um, we are aware of um, other people's perspectives and making sure that uh, we know how to address them and uh, how to talk to people um, who have different perspectives. But I think also for me, sometimes I had to remove myself from that because that can get exhausting sometimes of just like, I felt like sometimes I felt a pressure to always try and educate people and um, teach people and um, almost like validate my experience to them and convince them that it's true. And I know I kind of hit a wall <laughs> at one point and had to back away from that. But I do think that that is something that is important. Um, but you also have to uh, take care of yourself as well. Um, I also, I'm a big podcast person. And so um, I think that that's a great tool too, as far as just like listening to other people's perspectives and learning from that so yeah well thanks Simone Danny yeah I'm thankful for podcasts over the last year um I I learned kind of early on when I was curious and searching that um I couldn't just go to my black friends and ask for all the answers because to Simone's point it's not their job to educate me and, um, and there's a grief that they, that they have, that they're going through, that it's almost ignorant of me to just constantly go to a well that's not, you know, that they're not, I don't want to use them in that, in that way, if that makes sense. Um, so I've just been extremely thankful for podcasts, um, to listen to conversations and, and that's within Christianity and outside of it as well, just to kind of get a whole scope of, of um, thoughts to help learn. But I will say, I mean, I'm working through Esau's book right now and that's so helpful, especially I love scripture. And so hearing, hearing him, um, I'm listening to it on audio book. So I feel like you're talking to me Esau, but hearing him talk about it and read scripture and um, it's so helpful for me. So there's been a combination of just really reading books, but also listening to podcasts and hearing conversations, as well as um, having face-to-face -face conversations with friends and um, some of my players and just people that are in my community as well. Thanks, Danny. Sam. Well, first of all, Danny, I just, I mean, if we just listen like the care like the care, Danny, that even that you're approaching the situation with, like even me, I'm listening. And it's like, sometimes as a, as a, as a, as whether a black person or even an educated black person or a Christian who's black, like sometimes you get all these questions from, you know, if we get them, you know, from our, our white brothers and sisters. And it's like, like Simone said, I don't want to have to be the one to always have all the answers. And sometimes I'm tired of, of giving all the answers. So even just the care, the care of saying, you know what, I can actually do some education on my own, right? Whether it's uh, reading Esau's book or, 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 or checking out my book or listening to podcasts or uh, checking out some, uh, some books. Uh, one book that was a great resource for me was a book called Divided by Faith, right? Like there's so many really good resources that we, can, that we can use. And so for me, I just think about this. I was listening this morning to Kirk Franklin on NPR's Tiny Desk, which if y'all haven't listened yet, just it, it it went it hit i mean bro i was yes i wanted to i wanted that to be my walk that's gonna be my walk-up music danny when i go to do my softball and and i saw i was i was looking at it on youtube and i and i saw some of the comments and many were praiseworthy and people were excited but some people said wow i'm not even a christian and this really affected me and i looked at that and i said hmm why does it even matter whether you're a christian or not when it comes to music right this is just music and it was joyful music, right? So then it got me thinking the way I interact or people interact, oh, wow, Sam, I'm not even a Christian and what you said really helped me. Like our, as, as followers of Jesus, our job is to permeate places and spaces in the entire world, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, not go in your holy huddle and circle up and stay warm, right? And so, and so for me, just remembering that I'm called to be salt and light, Simone talked about the community, Danny talked about podcasts, right? Esau, 
he talked about some of the resources that he that he has going to scripture. I just think about the fact that okay, I'm called to be salt and light, and sometimes I feel dry and 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 tasteless, and so I need other people, other resources, friends, places, and spaces where I can just cry, where I can emote, where I can be real. Right, my book is called "Let the World See You: How to Be Real in a World Full of Fakes." Where can I be real? Where can I be honest? Where can I ask questions? Where can I just be who God made me to be and face some of the injustices, not only outside of the church, but inside of it as well? I was I was thinking about the same thing that Sam said, that I was happy that Danny said that she looked for information for herself. Because I like to tell people, and I'm really appreciative when people like read my book, I'm happy. But I t- I'm not Black Christian Google. So people will like read my book and then they'll up me. Issa, what are the next 10 books I should read? Where is this? And I was like, bro, like I got a job, I teach. So if you want like to be educated, like Wheaton isn't always enrolling. And so there is this real sense in which like, even like on social media, if I post something, it is an invitation for you to think about it. It's not an invitation for me to give the entirety of the entire, like it took me my whole life to like come to this place where I'm even still now trying to make sense of being black and Christian in a world that wants to step on one or the other. And so just like, if there is one thing that if you get nothing else out of this, like the the ability to get agency for yourself and to gain education and not to expect African-Americans to do the work. And even when Simone was talking about how she felt this need to educate everybody, to convince people that like she, so she, she need, there's a sense which as African-Americans, we want people to admit that what we are experiencing is real so we realize that we're not crazy. But like the fact is we're not crazy. <laughs> and like, so like it happened, whether or not people acknowledge it or, or not. And so it, the hard part for me is to learn how to like take a breath and realize I can't educate the entirety of the world and that I know what happened to me. I know what is happening to me. And I literally know what's happening to black people in America and I'm not crazy. And the truth of that does not depend upon gaining everybody, gaining a social consensus about that reality. So I want to say like, yes, Danny, like you you shot up like my charts and the I look for myself. That might be a low bar, <laughs> but the I look for myself just puts you in a hero category. Um, so thank you for that. Well, that's important. I mean, it's, it it reminds us that what we're what we're talking about is a is a holistic reality. It it affects our physical well being, our spiritual well being, but also um, our emotional well being. Um, and someone and someone asked from the from the from the audience what, with 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 twenty twenty being being what it was. Um, were there were there were there emotions that you felt freer to express that you didn't in the past? And how and how have and, and and how how do you think how do you think that functioned in particular our current political and social climate and and specifically as a as a Christian what does what does that what has that kind of uh, what what has that emotional um, emotional struggle looked like l- looked like for you this can be anyone I'll jump in first with two times. Um, there's this Lecrae song in his last album called Nothing Left to Hide. And like, I just love the title of the song and I love the song itself. And it's just like, he just like put it out there. And I remember um, during this summer, it was when I first started writing regularly for um, the New York Times. And I'm gonna get like the um, the um, the timeline wrong. It was George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery. Is that correct? Give me, forgive me. It was Ahmed Aubrey and George. Other, other yeah. way. Yeah. 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 So I, wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote an article um, when Ahmed Aubrey died in the New York Times called Ahmed, Ahmed Aubrey in the America that doesn't exist. Um, and um, I remember how I felt like when that happened. And forgive me, once again, like my time frame is off, but like it, at least publicly, the conversation about Breonna Taylor and um, George Floyd followed straight after that. And if I remember in my brain, um, I didn't write about Breonna Taylor, but I did write about George Floyd, because actually by this point, I couldn't do three of them. And so when the George Floyd story hit, I wrote um, like what the Bible has to say about black anger. And I remember like when I wrote the first half of that article and I think it was like the darkest stuff like um, um, that I've written because it started off, I remember there's a refrain, there's a video of a black man being, there's two videos of black men being choked to death, right? There's not one, there's two. 
there's a video. And so I went, there's a video, there's a video, there's a video. And in my brain, I remembered seeing the pictures that are still on the internet of black lynchings from, from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, where they would lynch black people and take pictures of us, right? And so I said, this idea of, of, of like the, the literal the visual presentation of black trauma is, um, is something that was, that was not new. And I felt like by the time we get to like 2020, there was like nothing left to hide. And like where I'm from, they say, you might as well say it how you feel it. And I'm always trying to be measured and trying to think through what is plausible and move people along and help push the culture forward. But there were these moments where I just said, you know, I got to say it how I feel it. So it was like those events, those two articles, I'm in Arbery in America that doesn't exist. And then um, the, um, the uh, George Floyd and the Psalms of Rage. I forget what the name of the, the article is. Both of them are in the Times. But then if you fast forward to the, the insurrection at the Capitol, and it was like for four years, we had once again um, talked about this problem. And it felt like the culmination of this thing. And I wrote an article, I don't even remember the name of it. It was in Religious News Service. I don't even remember the name of it. It was something like, I remember the title that I wanted to give me got nothing left to hide. But I said, once again, we have to say, and so I think, there, I think that there have been these moments where kind of the ugly underbelly of America has exposed itself so clearly, there was nothing left to do but describe it. And even describing it feels like a radical act, right? Like describing what is happening feels like you're saying too much, but it's like, this is what's actually happening. And so I think there've been like those three times where personally I've said, all I can do as a writer is say, this is us. And it, it was, I was writing in a way that I didn't think that I would ever do publicly because I didn't think that, like, the situation. One of the things, sorry, I know I'll, I'll stop up here. Like, so now I teach New Testament. And so a lot of times you have a, like stock analogies that you use to kind of explain portions of um, the Bible. So like today in class, we were talking about when they destroyed the temple in, in the New Testament. And I used to always say, it would be like if someone came and stormed the White House and said, this thing's going to be under God's judgment. But now that, that analogy that I used to explain what Jesus did to the temple and how like profound it was, there actually was somebody who stormed the White House. And so like all of my analogies of like, it would be like this happening have actually occurred in 2020. And so I'm needing to find even new language to now sound like audacious because now the students understand. They actually literally know what it feels like for someone to come to the heart of your institution and trouble it. And so I think that there's been a lot that's happened in America in 2020, and it's happening in 2021. It's kind of revealing some of the ways in which we're not all that we could be. Thanks, Esau. Other thoughts? Sam, yeah. I know for me, the emotion was anger. <clears throat> I just remember feeling angry and sad. Angry and sad. And 20, 2020 in general was a rough year, right? Kobe died at the top of 2020, pandemic, and then Ahmaud Arbery. And then obviously the Breonna Taylor, like that, that I, don't, I don't even know the timeline, but so she had been killed and then George Floyd. And I'm sitting here like, and, and there were still people who said, well, we gotta wait and see what really happened. I'm like, what do you mean wait and see? Like we've seen. What more is there to, to see? Like the, the part that got me was the fact that people could literally sit there and be like, well, we don't really know. And it, you know, we got to find the evidence. I'm like, guys, this is like as clear as day. I was angry, but I was also sad because I was like, what else is it going to take? How, how, many, how many more black people are, are going to have to be killed for us Christians even to say, hey, that's not okay. It's not okay. I was on a Zoom call with some nonprofit leaders in Chicago, and then this almost addresses someone asked a question about the military piece as well. Uh, some African American men and women who were leaders of this nonprofit, Christians, followers of Jesus, bona fide believers, they had seen what was going on, they were watching, 
And one of the guys said, I'm, I don't know if this is okay, but I'm questioning my faith right now. Another, another man said, 60 something year old black man, he said, I went to war for this country. I fought for this country and I came back and it's as if this country has turned its back on me. I, I had been in Arizona at the time and I'd actually made a, a, a road trip, like a cross country road trip back to Chicago. I was there training, trying to stay ready and stay in shape because Chicago had closed down. And I was making this road trip kind of right after George Floyd was killed. So I wasn't really watching TV. I didn't know about the, the, what was going on in the media with looting and rioting and all the things that was being portrayed. So I finally got back home, if you will, to Chicago and, you know, turn on the news and there's these pictures of looting and rioting and unrest. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Right. Anger, sadness, confusion, frustration, fear in a lot of ways. And then, like I said, I hopped on that zoom call and I just listened and, and it was like, what do we do? What do we do? And I don't even know if the, the, the leader of this nonprofit knew that I was on the call. So I hopped on late. And I guess she saw, she said, Sam, do you have any words to say? And my response, I believe it was from the spirit of God. I just said, man, what if God is allowing some of this community to be torn down so that he can build it up the way that he would want it to be built? Thinking about the West side, the South side, right? Like what if that, what if that's what's happening, right? Thinking about Nehemiah, let me go and rebuild the walls. Like what if that was happening? It was just a, 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 a fleeting thought, if you will. But then I started thinking about, okay, what do I have? How do I channel my anger, my emotion, my sadness, my fear, my frustration? And one thing I love doing, I love bringing people together. And obviously playing the NFL, got friends in MLB, in baseball, soccer, football, uh, basketball. And so I just got some people together. I said, what if we just listened to people in this community who are hurting? Instead of making our judgments, instead of saying this is a problem or not, let's just go and listen. And so we did, we got about 10 pro athletes from all the different teams in Chicago, sat down with about 30 kids from the West side and the South side and about 10 or 15 police officers. We sat in things called listening circles, healing circles, and we just listened. And you heard a lot of fear, a lot of sadness, anger, frustration from, from kids, from cops, from everyone. But then after that, we took a tour of the West side of Chicago because we saw the videos of the looting and the rioting. We said, let's actually see what's really going on. And yes, we saw buildings boarded up. Yes, we, that, that was a real thing. But, but what we also saw was we saw a community that it seemed like no one cared about. I asked Jason Hayward, a, a baseball player who was with us, I said, how many, how many grocery stores have you counted on our, on our 30 minute kind of bus tour? He said, maybe one. I said, okay, great. How many, how many liquor stores have you seen? He said, over 10. So like, I just, like, and I say that to say there are, there are systemic issues. There are uh, systematic issues that exist, right? It's almost like there's two different Americas that you don't always experience unless you go in and visit and take a seat or take a pull up a chair in someone else's neighborhood and someone else's reality. And so part of what we did was we channeled our emotion and said, let's try and build something. We got a chance to tear down a liquor store, build up a food mart, which was fun. It was great. But it was this idea of like, of listening, feeling, emoting, not just for ourselves, but for and with other people as well. Thanks, Sam. That's helpful. Simone, Danny, Simone. Yeah. Um, similar to Sam, I would say for me, it was, I just had a lot of emotions. I was very angry. I was very sad, but I was also very cynical. And for a while, I had to just sit with the cynicism that I had. Um, I remember after um, George Floyd uh, calling my mom ugly crying <laughs> and just talking about not just what's going on in the US, but how my faith plays a role in that. Because as a Christian and as someone who's grown up in the church and God has had his hand on my life, my whole life. But then I see something like this happen. And in my heart, I'm like, but God, like how, and do you not know I'm black? <laughs> and all there's black people here. And it's just all these emotions of just like, do you not see me? 
And that was something I had to work through with my mom. I remember on the phone, just crying about it. And later on, a couple of days later, I remember calling my sister, um, just thinking about soccer and social justice and all of that, because I'm like, okay, I see what's going on in the world. I experience it, social, just, social injustice, police brutality, systemic racism is here. And what am I doing about it? Like, <laughs> I'm literally out here kicking a soccer ball, going to training, coming home. Like, what am I doing? And I kind of had like an existential crisis to be completely honest of what am I doing with my life when I see all of this going on and I have the nerve to kick a ball. <laughs> and I remember my sister telling me that it's not about what you're doing. It's about using your jersey to make sure that you get people to care about the things that matter and that you use that as a platform to speak on the things that are important. And for me, that kind of shifted why I play soccer and why and how I use my platform. And I think it's been interesting these past few months as um, just understanding my uh, church community as well, because I think for a while it was challenging for me because as I said, I've, for me personally, it was like, I knew where I stood when it comes to my relationship with God because God has worked so much in my life that I feel like I can't question his character. But it was hurtful for me because sometimes it felt like the people that are supposed to represent him weren't being loving <laughs> towards me. And I didn't really feel accepted necessarily in the church community. And the church is supposed to be my home. And there's so much division, especially when it comes to racial issues. And so for me, I had to almost rebuild my church community and figure out where do I fit within this? And um, you know how Esau talked about educating people and all of that. It's like, how do I wanna exhaust myself and do all of this? Or how much do I wanna extend myself in that manner? And I think I had to learn about my own boundaries in that way, but I also am appreciative of like, of how God has always been faithful and has still um, given me a, a great community to help build me up during this time. But I think there is still a lot of issues that have to be addressed in conversations when it comes to race, because I think a lot of times when it comes to the church, we can be reluctant to have those conversations because it's hard and people don't wanna talk about it because it makes people uncomfortable, but that doesn't make the issue go away. So, yeah. Yeah. To add to that, with the with with the kinds of developments that have that have, that have that have happened over the course of the last nine months, there have been there have been folks who are um, folks whose eyes have been opened, who are now who are now really kind of deeply committed to this work. But I believe it was I think it was a Pew study. Someone someone did a study, but basically but basically it showed that while there while there have been folks who who have who have, who have actually started to dig into this work. Um, the events of this past year have ha have actually also hardened the hearts of 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 others to the extent that actually proportionally there are more people less willing to engage in this work now than there were a year ago, and that's and that's 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 surprising, um, but it but it but it also but it also reminds us that this is that this is a difficult this is a difficult endeavor that we're that that we're engaged in. Um, as these as these events happen, there are some there are some hearts that are that are softened, yes, um, but 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 perhaps discouragingly, there are also there are also hearts that are that are hardened, um, and so we need so we need to be able to kind of invest in resources to be able to actually work through work through that reality. John, I know you had I know you had a question, but Danny, Danny, was there was there anything that you were you were thinking about? I was just going to share, um, I just remember a moment in the midst of just, it seemed like so many um, Black deaths, like one after the other after the other. And I remember um, just reaching out to some of our athletes um, and just trying to um, 
just trying to reach out, make sure that they were okay, or um, just to let them know that I cared about them. And it was like three days in a row that I was like, oh, I saw the news or I heard, are you okay? And it was just like, goodness gracious. Like, and this is probably my privilege showing, but those three days I was like, this is hard and I don't live it. Like, I don't, I don't have to, I can stick my head in the sand. I don't have to live it. And um, I think just even walking alongside in a way, uh, Albert Tate, I love that he always says, um, I can't just take my ball and go home. Like I have the ability to do that, but I want to be in this with them. Um, because when I look at, um, my student athletes, they matter to me. Um, and their, their life matters to me, not just what they do on a softball field. And so, um, just that little, that those three days, um, opened my eyes to a lot of just, um, what it looks like to grieve with them. Um, knowing I'll, I won't fully understand, but I just, uh, um, that's kind of just a little bit of, of, uh, kind of what I've felt just feeling it almost with you and I'll never feel it to the, the same extent that you, you all do. So appreciate all of you sharing your hearts and those emotions. I think that, that really helps uh, us connect, uh, with you and your stories. There's a question that's being asked that I think is a great next question. Uh, to you all. And it's um, someone asked, how do you care for yourself in this season as advocates, athletes, as human beings who are looked at to be experts? What, it, what, uh, you know, what kind of, what, what things do you do to recharge your, in your own woundedness? And, and Simone, you kind of mentioned a few of the things as you kind of shared, you know, what you did, but any other things here that, that, uh, that you all have found helpful to your own souls in the midst of this journey? Yeah, I would say one of the biggest things is prayer. You know, the Bible says, be careful for nothing, but with everything by prayer and supplication, make your quest be made known unto God and the peace of God will stand guard on your heart. And I think for me, that is what has gotten me through so many moments because I think when you don't have the answers, when you don't know where to go, when there is some, a sense of hopelessness at times, I think for me, prayer is what's gotten me through it. I've learned to just pray my way through things. And for me, that's definitely been what I've relied on. Um, I would say prayer definitely is the main thing. Um, I also think, like I said earlier, a community um, when I need a good cry <laughs> or just need to just talk about how I've been feeling or my experiences. Um, I've been blessed to have a, a strong church community and friends that I can rely on and just have these feelings and just lay it all out there. And for me, that, that just gives me a lot of healing. Just, you don't have to say the right things. It's just being heard. And so I would say both of those have is what I rely on. I think for me, it's just at crying. If I'm just gonna be totally honest, like making space to cry. People talk about the body keeps the score, right? Like your body, like you can only hold in so much. Like sometimes just letting the tears flow. And oftentimes you can try to keep it in as long as you, you can try, but you'll start for me, I start to feel it well up and usually it's like, no, suppress, suppress. You know, I don't want to, don't want to go there. Cause I, once it comes out, I don't know what's going to come out, but just allowing myself just to release that relief that, that like God gave us tear ducts for reasons, right? Like to cry. And so that, that, that'd be the answer for me. I would say for me, it's been giving myself permission to grieve. Because there were like some like you when you when you begin to engage this work, you're surprised by the enemies that you discover. Because I felt like, you know, this was pretty straightforward. Like this is just what it means to be a Christian. And at first I just couldn't believe that maybe we just don't understand if I articulate myself better, maybe then they'll like but then I realized like no, like there were actual fellow believers who, because I care about justice for black people, now perceive me as an enemy. 
And so I had to like grieve that reality that they weren't going away. That part of the cost of doing this work is having people who just like don't like you. And you, you can almost feel sometimes the palpable disdain that you kind of move through like mud. And so I just had to own it and say, you know what? People just aren't gonna like me and that's okay. But the other thing that I discovered is that you find friends in unexpected places. It's like, oh, I didn't realize that, oh, you're on the team. And so in the same way that you feel like you, within the, I'm not talking about non-belief, within the Christian community, you lose people from, you're not like, I'm not saying that, you just lose them. You can't be with them anymore. And then you go, oh, but look at so-and-so. I didn't even think she was about that life. And so then like you get this sense of real encouragement. And so for me, it's been like finding a group of people who, who share your values and who are committed to the same work as you are, who help keep you accountable. Because one of the things for me is like, I just don't have anyone to listen to sometimes. It's people who are like enemies, who are like bad faith. So having that community of people who I can turn to for counsel and who will say to me, you know, Esau, you know, stop talking about LeBron James on the internet, like whatever they're allowed to text me to do. <laughs> it's like, that. that's helpful. And, and to be honest, as... Um, I live in Chicago, man, and I try to argue about LeBron James being decent in basketball. I'm not even going to say anything more, um, which you can't do in Michael Jordan land, <laughs> apparently. See, even Sam's looking at me. He's feeling it. You see that? <laughs> so the other thing, though, as a writer, seriously, as a writer, I have to write when things happen because I feel so helpless. One of the things that I can do, I feel like one of the gifts that God has given me is, you know, y'all, y'all are athletes. I played a sport, y'all were athletes. <laughs> uh, and I think that what I can give to the church is I try to chronicle what's going on. And so when something happens that really, really deeply moves me, I write about it, even if people never see it. Most of the time, people never see, if I ever die, this is what you can do, Malcolm. When I, when, <laughs> if you outlive me, I'm going to give you my hard drive so you can see like version one. Because the first version, the first version never makes it to the internet. Y'all get the second or third draft. But when I write it how I feel it, my and my Twitter fingers are a little too hot. There's a whole file of burn everything down drafts. And then there's the like, here's the here's the Jesus is taking over. And he said, <laughs> and so part of me as 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 a way of processing these things is getting like that first draft out. And the only time that the first draft ever made it to the internet was that Psalms in Black Rage one. The first couple of paragraphs of that, that's draft one. <laughs> like literally, I'm sorry, like when it happened, I saw it on TV or I saw it on Twitter or wherever it is. And I went and I sat down like from that moment and typed it up within like 45 minutes. And so part of me is like in order, I can't, I can't, it's like stuck inside of me unless I talk about it, I, it, it, it'll like eat me alive. And so like what Sam talks about crying, maybe this is my way of like letting out the emotions is putting it to paper. Thanks, Esau. I have a, I have a particular question for, uh, for Danny. Danny, so as you as you coach as you coach as you coach students partic particularly, um, what it, 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 is there anything that you is there anything so as you're I mean you know as you're as you're essentially training this this next generation of athletes, are there do you do you see them engaging in these conversations differently? Have you ha, have you sought to, um, to kind of shape that atmosphere in a in a particular way? If so, if, if so, how? That's a good question. Um, I've tried. Um, I think something that sports has shown me in my time as a coach and as a player is that teams are like small little microcosms of the world. And so um, obviously they're, you're, you're chasing after this um, common goal, um, which helps to unify a team. But that doesn't mean that there's not tension or um, or struggle within the team. And I, I, I would imagine Simone can kind of speak to this as well, but um, I know for our team specifically through the past year, um, and this is something that I feel like I've always tried to do as a coach is they're so much more than an athlete. I always try to see them as people first. And so that's why the shut up and dribble comments always 
always bother me because, um, and I would say for, for Sam and Simone who do it professionally, like this is their career. If someone told me that in my career, what I do for 12 to 14 hours a day, that's probably excessive, but for a long period of time, um, not to be myself, to only worry about X's and O's, it would be so unfulfilling. And so to ask an athlete to do that would be, would be very difficult. And so it's not just athletes chasing a win, um, to be unified to win. It's, these are people with different backgrounds and that come from different family structures. And we're also asking them to coexist within a, a very tense society right now too. And so to ask them to only worry about sports, which would maybe unify them. It also is, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of putting a muffle on in a sense or stifling who they really are as people. And so I think in a, in a sense, I've, what I've always tried to say is I want to empower young people to, to live and play um, as they were created to be, like as that image bearer of God. And so um, in that comes their full personality and their full person, not just the athlete. And so there, there, are, there are tensions because there's tensions in the world, but being able to give space to have those conversations, I think is really important because they're gonna go into a world into a workplace and into different communities. And I want them to feel confident in looking people in the eye and having those conversations and hearing a different view and um, being able to communicate through those things. Um, but obviously there's also just, they're chasing that common goal as well. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I feel like ultimately it's, we're just like a little microcosm of, of what's happening in, in the big world as well. No, thanks, Danny. I mean, I think that's I think that's helpful. I think it, it's it, I mean, for anyone who has that opportunity to speak to speak into particularly the lives of young people, that's a it's a constant. I mean, it, there's a there's a constant negotiation that goes on that that, that goes on there. Um, Esau in the in the classroom. I mean, you're doing you're doing you're doing similar. I mean, you're doing similar sim, similar kind of work of 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 shaping. Have you have you seen these conversations take a take a different tack have you have, have you attempted to shape those in a in a particular way yeah i think that um one of the things that i try to do it's really interesting because when you're the black professor you know the black students expect you to like you know this it's time it's time you know we got the black prof here you know give it to them um and so there's that expectation that i'm going to champion like the causes that people know that um i'm passionate about but there's also the, sometimes that same suspicion like you know what is he going to say and so one of the things, and this might seem strange, one of the things that I do as a professor intentionally, this may seem like a weird thing to say, but I invite my, my classroom is black even when there's a largely white classroom. What I mean is when professors teach, they teach out of their narrative world, right? So they're talking about Seinfeld and Harry Potter and C.S. Lewis and like, like the, the, the analogies and, and the applications and all of these things come from their narrative world. When you come to my classroom, you're going to get black people. You're going to get outcasts and goody mob and Jay, and, like, and not just secular artists. You're going to have Kirk Franklin. And I'm going to talk about the civil rights movement as a way of explaining a passage in the New Testament or the abolitionist movement. So the stu and students, sometimes when they first come into my class, they're very disoriented. It's like, why is the guys always talking about race? Well, in black context, we would just slide in and out of racial conversations without it being this huge thing. We can say, okay, this happened, and then we move on. And I can see the students at first, they're like, can you do that? Can you talk about race in a way that's funny? Not in the sense of stereotyping, but like racial trauma that is like comedic, you know what I mean? And so um, one of the things that I do is I just introduce my students into that narrative world. So they get an understanding of what it's like for a, a black student who goes into the narrative world created by the professor. So like, I'm very intentional about not translating everything in my classroom so that, so that the minority students feel comfortable. And so I don't always then just let me, so like, it isn't like, here's the race talk that I give that the students want me to give. It's that I'm myself when I teach. And that introduces the students to a different way of being in the world. That it takes them a while to kind of get adjusted to. But after a while, they kind of go, this is, this is how class is. So I say that's part of it. But the other part of it is to kind of, sometimes I sit down and explain things. Because 
they're afraid. They've been sometimes taught that anytime you talk about justice, you're a critical race theorist or a Marxist. And so they kind of, when I started talking about justice, I said, okay, we're going to read what Jesus said. And they go, I said, but if Jesus sounds like a critical race theorist, then you have a real problem, right? So like when Jesus, I'm undoing the bounds of yokes. I mean, yokes of oppression. Like the, So you know, I, won't, I won't exegete for you right now. But like the, the fact that the Bible has a category of people called oppressed, right? The existence of the category. So I asked my students in, in class today, what is an oppressed person? Oh, it's someone that society mistreats. I said, so, so there's a power imbalance implied in the idea of strong stepping on the weak by the definition of the person, right? It's both legal and social. So I said, if Jesus stands up for the oppressed, then he recognizes the oppressed as the category, then he's talking about systems of oppression. And so they kind of go, well, hold on. So, so just like helping them to walk through this is important. And I said, look, I said, sorry, this, I'm going to give you like 30 more seconds of Bible because you invited the Bible professor on here, right? I said to them, I asked them in class today, hey, in the Bible, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, why was Nebuchadnezzar judged by God? And they all go, oh, because of pride. I said, okay, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. And then I said, what does Daniel say to Nebuchadnezzar as to why he's going to be judged by God? He says, well, cease off your wickedness and your oppression of the poor. I said, well, hold on. Then it's like God has sent the prophet to a pagan king to stop mistreating poor people. Imagine that. God expects a secular government, a non-Jewish government, to treat poor people well. So how do we make sense of that when we say that in America, there is no obligation for a secular government to treat poor people well? I said, we're doing biblical interpretation here. And so helping, and helping my students to learn how to read the Bible well. I don't have a political agenda. I have a biblical agenda. All right. I said, like, be faithful to the text. And so helping students go through this idea that some of these, um, these ideas that they've associated with whatever they associated with them with, this isn't even Greek or Hebrew. I was like, this isn't English. And so helping them learn how to become good readers of the text is my goal as a professor. And if a good reading of the text cuts across different, like if you stay in my class long enough, every political party is going to, going, going, going to get the smoke. Right? We want to, we, they want all of it. And so when they begin to see that, that I'm not trying to like push for some agenda, but like as the text confronts us, we have to learn how to live it, then that's just what they experience. And so I think that like they go from fear and not, or, or kind of dis-ease to understanding that like, you know, what we're trying to do here in this class is become better, better readers of the Bible. And you, when you're a good reader of the Bible and you're about the kingdom, then you see how it cuts across all of these different political lines, which is a glorious freedom to have. It's a glorious freedom to have. So anyways, that's what I'm trying to do in my classes. Come on, somebody. Uh, so, <laughs> John, I, I know you got, I know you got. Esau, I'm glad, I'm glad you're the Bible guy not tonight, not the football guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm eating at the table tonight. Really good stuff. I've, uh, I've actually read your book twice, but tonight I feel like I've been in a Wheaton classroom. So that's, that's great stuff. Got a question for Simone. Um, you know, all of us, as we turned on the news last summer-ish, saw Portland in the news a lot, right? As literally the center of the city was occupied by the civilians, right? And, and kicked everybody out and that whole scene. And and so there's been a question asked, you know, for you, obviously living in Portland, um, you know, what was that like um, for you to be in that city this last year uh, with the protest activity and the national scrutiny and, and even in conversation on your team? Any thoughts you can share with us? Uh, yeah, it was definitely an interesting time. So I would say July, I think, is when things started getting a little hectic. And for us, we were doing the Challenge Cup in Utah. And so we were all in a bubble. And I remember for, in a bubble for the tournament. And I remember it just being a weird time because, you know, I still, my friends are all back in Portland. And I'm getting these texts. I'm seeing things on Twitter and social media about 
everything that's happening, but I'm in a bubble. And so it was just like, what is going on? Like what's happening? All of that. And once our tournament ended and we um, got to go back to Portland, um, it was definitely a contentious time. I think it was interesting because it was in your face and you couldn't really escape it. And for us, we ended up having like later on some games for the fall series. And so our team, we still had to stay in a bubble. And so um, we weren't really allowed to interact with people outside of like our teammates and everything. And so although we were here in Portland, we weren't allowed to be a part of like the protests or anything like that, or you couldn't really, yeah, take part in that. And so it was interesting because although we couldn't really take part in that, we still saw it every day. And it's like, you walked out, like our stadium is in downtown Portland. And when you go to the stadium and during the day and you walk down the street, you will see like where all the protests were going down. You'll see um, the graffiti and everything that was happening. And so for us, it was interesting because I felt like it made it so that you can't run from it. You can't pretend that it's not there. Um, although the, the, the hoopla had kind of calmed down and that people um, had stopped like talking about racism as much, um, for us, you couldn't escape it because of what was going down. And I think for us as a team, that was powerful because then it's like, no, this is still real. Racism is still here and we still have to have these conversations. And so, yeah, I think for us, it was a reminder of what's going on. Yeah, thanks, Simone. Thanks for sharing that. Sam. I got some, I got some, I got some, I, 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 have, a, I have a question for you. Um, particularly with your, with your, with your network and influence, um, as you've had opportunities, particularly to speak about issues of issues of racial justice, I'm sure, I'm sure you've gotten, I'm sure you've gotten a range of, of, of responses and reactions, uh, from those, from those around you, um, different spheres reacting, reacting differently. Um, what, 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 or what have you experienced? How have you, how have you navigated kind of the different, the different spaces in which you find yourself? Uh, how do you, how do you juggle, how do you juggle all that? For me, sometimes it is somewhat of a of a juggling act. And and quick side note, Esau, I'm going to sit in on your class like I have to. This is happening whether it's on Zoom or in person. I will drive to Wheaton and sit in on this class. I'll try to exegete myself, and so just be prepared to hear hear from me soon. But um, yeah, for me, it's definitely been a, a juggling act because if anybody know, that knows me, they know I'm I'm usually like I always say the right want to say the right thing and. And not necessarily politically correct by any means, but it's like, okay, let me really think through this answer and not respond emotionally, but try to respond logically or intelligently or whatever. And there have been very many times where both the emotion and the logic have collided and it hasn't necessarily been pretty. I remember it may have been a, uh, Jacob Blake. I think it was Jacob Blake got killed and I remember having this feeling, right? I was, I was this close to tweeting it, my first edition. I was going to say, uh, um, right, exactly. I was going to say, America is, because people have this conception, I'll call it a misconception that black people aren't safe, right? You're driving down the neighborhood. Oh, there's some black people. Let me go on this side. Or let me, it's like black people, I'm not really safe around them. Let me clutch my purse a little bit tighter. Let me, you know what I mean? I'm, just, I don't really know. And, and then I started thinking, I said, it's not that black people aren't safe. It's really, I feel like America is not safe for black people. Like it's, uh, you know, and, and, and I was literally this close to tweeting and I said, you know, let me run it by a friend, right? Let me just try and whatever, run it by a friend who's a believer, loves Jesus and like thinks critically white guy, critical, critical thinker. And I said that to him. I showed him like what I was about to tweet and his response was, he, he said, dude, the world isn't safe for black people. And I was like, bruh you are so right. Go to even places like Italy and you see racism. Um, go to um, pretty any, any country you go to, right? Like the world is not safe for black people. So I just tweeted 
America is not safe for black people, knowing that I could have gone a step further. And I got a ton of, and it wasn't this thing of like, oh, let's see what people say. I was like, this is factual. It's logical, it's emotional, it's factual. America is not safe for black people. And I got so much flack of like, what are you thinking? And even people were like, hey man, you're trying to get a job right now. Maybe you should kind of talk less and say, I was like, dude, I don't care anymore. Like, I really don't. Like, if, 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 if like, I'd rather, I'd rather speak up for those. Say it again. <laughs> Said, nothing left to hide. I, that's nothing like, left to hide. <laughs> nothing left to hide. Right? Like what? What? I love what Lecrae said in that song. He said, "I'm not homophobic or anti-Semitic, so give me a little credit before you give me edits." Like I'm not. Like I'm not here trying to promote any political party uh, or, or or any agenda. I'm trying to promote Jesus. And like Jesus says, speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. He says in Isaiah 58, what is true fasting? He says, you all fast and you're, you're, you're fasting, but, it, but you're oppressing your workers, right? You're saying, okay, let me fast, let me not work, let me, but let me oppress my workers. He said, you, God's like, do you think this is real fasting? How about you take care of the orphan and the widow? How about you don't turn your black on, back on your own flesh? Yeah. That's I, 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 what real I, I, fasting I, 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 is. I like the line. We're going to talk about Lecrae even here. I'm going to tell him we talked about him all day. But uh, <laughs> you said, I can't believe they, they let us make it this far. <laughs> That's yeah. What and I was like, I'm going to tell you something. I remember, sorry, I keep talking about this article, but I remember when I wrote it, it was like my farewell to the New York Times. Because <laughs> what it was is, I said, I'm going full Jesus. What the Bible has to say, about, like my editor, I was like, here. Like, what do you think? Well, what does the Bible got to say about this? I didn't have any other answer. I said, I went full Jesus. And I really thought, I really thought when I wrote that, they would never call me again. Because hmm. the only answer that I had was Jesus, like in the hmm. article. And then when they called me back, um, I was just like, oh, maybe may, sometimes God blesses us when we're brave enough to tell the truth. Mm-hmm. And we always calculate. I think, I think like, and this is what, like, as, a, as an African American, you can't just be, I like, like, don't be a martyr unless you have to. Choose the time and means of your own crucifixion, right? But so, like, I'm not saying just like burn everything down and burn everything down. But I think what you're getting to is that sometimes you get to this place where we have to tell the truth, and sometimes God honors that. And so, like, we're both gainfully still employed. So maybe, <laughs> maybe <there's> that. <laughs> And, but but even to that point, like even to that point, like it, uh, there there's almost became this piece of okay, let me document and chronicle even on Instagram what's going on, whether it's the insurrection or all these things, because I feel like people aren't going to believe it, people are going to forget it. So I almost felt it my my mini little job to like okay, let me post about what's actually happening. And in some of those posts, you saw this emotion. I was like, man, if black people would have done <laughs> would have gone and stormed the Capitol, we would have been dead like dead and that's not a that's not like a an irrational statement that's a that's a, you know and 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 i posted that and one of my friends was like hey man you're you know you're still looking for a job you know i'm like well it doesn't matter anymore like i i don't care I, I don't care but somebody has to say something i can't just continue to sit here and be quiet i have to let it out somehow some way and to to, to esau's point sometimes you'll lose some friends some followers some fans, some family. But when I tell you, you'll gain more friends, followers, fans, and family that you ever could have imagined, that's what's going to happen. God shows up on the other side of risk. And sometimes, just sometimes, that risk looks like speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves, biblical. That risk looks like, uh, what does James 1, 26, 27 say about true and undefiled religion, right? It's taking care of the orphan and the widow in their needs. Sometimes it looks like saying, oh, wow, there are people who are actually oppressed, even with 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 football, right? I'm in, uh, and I'm on one. Of, I'm on the executive committee member, vice president of NFL Players Association. I was watching the draft, and I was watching all these, yeah, yes, black players getting drafted. But why are all the coaches white? Why are all the general managers white? Why are all the owners white? So I'm seeing on TV like this, like man, owner, coach, GM, decision maker, people in power, white, player, black. And it just reminded me, and I, I wrote an article in the Players Tribune and I titled it Upstairs versus Downstairs. Based on my experience, but also based on facts, how you walk into an NFL facility and the players' locker rooms are downstairs and all the coaches' offices are upstairs. Players predominantly black, coaches predominantly white. And you say, well, it's just players, coaches, not a big deal. But the one coach 
the one coach who's, whose office is usually downstairs in most facilities, it's a, it's a person with the position title director of player engagement. Usually that, that coach is the liaison between the players and the coaches and management. And usually that coach is black. So his office is downstairs, right? The black coach put him downstairs with the players so we can relate, no, no power, no decision-making. Um, and then everything else is upstairs. I started looking more into it just based on, because the NFL had this thing called the Rooney Rule, right? In 2003, let's create this rule to, to try and add more, get more diversity in coaching, right? There, that, it actually been statistically proven that at the time, black coaches outperformed their white counterparts, yet they were being fired at a higher rate. Black coaches at the time, there are only three of them averaged 1.4 more wins in their final year before being fired than their white counterparts. And they got hired, uh, they got rehired at a lower rate. And so the NFL, on the, they were on the verge of being sued based on the, this data. They created this rule called the Rooney Rule, where they said, okay, teams are now mandated to interview, just interview a minority candidate. And what we saw three years later in 2006, you saw an increase from three black coaches to seven black coaches and two black coaches coaching in the Super Bowl. Right. Lovey Smith, Tony Dungy. Right. So it's like the, the statistical significance of that. I think there was like a less than a 4% chance that, that based on statistics that you'd have two black coaches coaching in the Super Bowl. Right. In, in a matter of three years. So you think, man, things are changing and things are great. Well, fast forward 17, 18 years later, there's just three black coaches in the NFL. Why do I tell this story? I tell this story because I had to say something. God didn't give me this platform just to sit back and say, well, it is what it is. I'll just live with it. No, I had to say something. I had to write something. I had to do something. Just recently uh, in Chicago, I got a chance to speak up for an Indian uh, Indian American coach who similarly was never going to get an opportunity because a lot of, I'm going probably a lot NFL. I know John, you're talking about the NFL and the, the, you know, the football question. Like I'm the football guy. So I'm going to talk about football for a second. Um, in the NFL, when it comes to co- when it comes to positions of power, it seems like there's a lot of cronyism and nepotism, right? Friends hiring friends, or hey, I'm gonna hire my son, or all these things, my son-in-law. Where and the best candidate doesn't always get the job, and so for the majority of the decision makers are white, and they're comfortable, like they're not gonna hire the black guy or the Indian guy, whatever. And so like I use my platform, my voice to speak up for this Indian coach who's just as qualified as all the other white coaches. And you know what happened? He got hired. He got hired. And so I know I'm, I'm kind of ma- raising my voice and making a point, but the, the purpose of me saying this is that there are times where we need to speak up, where we need to say something, right? We need to show up for our friends, for our counterparts. Like Danny said, it's not just like, hey, what do I do? What do I read? It's like, no, I've actually read it. I've listened to it. I'm learning. How can I help? What can I do? What can I say to go and help be a change? I'm not just going to sit on the sideline. I'm going to get in the game. Put me in, coach. Notably, Sam, and then and then and then and then John, I know you got you got one more question. Great, that, great that, stuff, Sam. I just wish you were more passionate, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, man, and 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 Sam, what you what you what you note, um, what you what you note is something that is that's that's clear in sectors in sectors throughout throughout the country. It's in sports. It's in education. It's in other. It's it's in it's in other sectors as well. Um, and so, and and so, it's important, like I said, as you as you said, to have the courage to be able to speak in those in those in those contexts. John, you got one more question, and then yeah, we'll... I just thought it'd be interesting, Danny, to have you weigh in on this conversation. I would bet because you and I look similar skin tone, that you're in conversations that I'm in when the room looks all like you and me, and there's ignorance there, right? In fact, people people don't want to believe any of the conversation that's going on tonight. I would imagine you've been in some of those conversations as I have. How have you, how have you dealt with that? How have you kind of, as Sam said, how, how have you been able to stand up and, and, and give, give someone a voice? Yeah, I um, am not going to know who to credit this with, but I, ju- I remember listening to someone say, um, what matters is what I say in a room full of people who look like me. Um, and I think, I think white people have a, the chance to not say anything. They have the chance to, to kind of be comfortable and, and not um, risk anything, um, not to say something when there's cost involved. And I, I think what's hard for me is when I listen 
to everyone who's been on this call, when I've listened to you share your heart, um, there's a pain behind it that matters to me. And I don't know you all personally, but I tell you what, there are um, athletes on a, on a team that I coach right now and former athletes that I've had, and I listen to the pain that they feel and that matters to me. And I think when I choose, want to choose to be comfortable or I wanna to choose to speak for them, um, and I'm saying them as like, I'm thinking about my athletes when I'm talking is, um, I'm gonna risk being comfortable because when I'm on the softball field, I ask them, get comfortable being uncomfortable. I'm sure we've been in the sports world, we've all heard that phrase. Um, but I want their experience that I've heard and that I've listened to, to be on replay in my mind so that when I'm in a room um, or around a dinner table or whatever the case may be, when it's you and me, John, and people that look like us that that I speak up because I've heard the stories and I'll never fully understand it, but I, I can hear the pain behind the stories that I've heard and I can hear the fight that, um, that they have for a better future. And I wanna be a part of that. And so I think that's kind of what spurs me on. And then it's just engaging in those conversations um, and hoping that there's some open-mindedness um, to be able to grow with others. I, I do want to share one thing, and I guess it goes with this, is and I, it's uh, what's something that kind of uh, triggered just some sort of passion in me, but listening to Austin Channing Brown talk to Brene Brown on a podcast, she said, and I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up, but she said for... Um, for white people, one of the things that we can do is, she said, in this moment, I am going to decide that the face in front of me has something, knows something, or can share something that I am desperately in need of because I am not superior. And I have played that on loop in my mind because I think it goes for anybody as just seeing the face across from me, that's an image bearer of God. And so that alone gives them value. And so they, can share something or know something that I'm desperately in need of. And I just wonder what all I'm missing out on if I don't, um, if I don't choose to believe that that person might know something that I don't have, or I don't know. I, um, I'm going to I'm sorry, I'm going on a rant, but I'm going to say one more thing because Jamar Tisby said this and he said the, the fact that I'm in this brown skin matters to God and it matters to me being made in the image and likeness of God. That is part of me being in the image and likeness of God. All this beautiful dizzying array of differences that we have in humanity. If you don't see color, then, then there's an aspect of my image bearing that you choose to ignore. Like what are we missing out on about who God is? Because he created all of us and we all are different. And so I just wonder as, as a white person, like, what am I missing out on if I'm just saying to, to all black people, hey, come be like us or come to, to our church because it's the norm. It's not. And so it's, it's what am I missing out on about God? And that alone makes me curious. That's awesome, Danny. Thanks for the Sam-like rant at the end. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, well, in this, in this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply thankful for this, for this time that, for this time that we've had. I think we've given, I think we've given the folks, the folks watching some good, some good stuff to, some good stuff to chew on, um, and some good stuff to, 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 to apply. Um, for those, for those watching, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a survey that's about to, that's about to come out for you to, for you to, for you to take a look at, but. But I just want to I want to take a moment just to just to pray just to pray for us before we uh, before we separate. Um, a question that someone asked was, you know, how do you how do, how do you how do you persevere? How do you continue? How do you continue to fight the good fight, so to speak? Um, when you look at the lives of, for example, I mean, it happened especially to W. B. Du Bois and and, uh, and Martin Luther King, but they both reached points in the points near the end of their lives where they hit just kind of points of disillusionment and de and despair and depression. Because they looked around, because they looked around at the at, at the world after their years of activism, and they saw that change was really, really, really slow. And so, particularly for us as the body of Christ, when we when we enter into these spaces, when we when we attempt to 
uh, to bet to 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 fight on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are who are who are oppressed. Um, we're we're going to face we're going to face obstacles, and we have to be and we have to be reminded of the fact that this is work that Christ has begun and it's work that He's going to finish. And so and, and so I want us to take a to take a moment to go before to go before the throne together um, and seek and seek and seek the Lord seek the Lord's face. If you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had, Lord, to uh, just to just to speak just to speak with one another, Lord, to uh, not only talk about our experiences, Lord, but also to extol to extol you, uh, Lord. You have you have brought us this far, uh, Lord. You have exposed the world to us, and so, Lord, I pray that I pray that each and every one of us would have would have courage, courage to speak in the in the in the spaces in which you've in which you've placed us, Lord, I pray that you would give us humility, Lord, that 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 we would have the mind that's ours in Christ Jesus, who though he was though he was in the form of God, didn't see equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but took on the form of a servant. Lord, may that may that humility guide us, Lord, as Danny as 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 Danny narrated, Lord, a humility that looks in the that that looks in the face across the table and says, what 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 is it that I have to learn from from you? Uh, where, where, where may I be blind? Where, where are there things that I, that I need to learn from you? Lord, may that, may that shape each, each and every one of our, each and every one of our relationships. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would grant us perseverance. Lord, even when we, especially when we run up against the obstacles that are, that are, that are often present in the battle for racial justice, Lord, uh, help, help remind us, Lord, that this is not something that we're just doing out of our own strength, Lord, but it's something that by your spirit, you're equipping us to do. So Lord, for the, for the, for the, for the athletes, for the scholars, for the ministers, Lord, a, a, equip, a, equip each and every one of us to, in everything that we do, Lord, seek your glory uh, and the good and the good of our neighbor. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. And we pray these things in the name of your son and by the power of your spirit. Amen. Well, to everyone, there's a and it as an as an invitation, uh, you can you can it, it, you can connect with Baylor Athletics, Faith and the Faith and Sports Institute, or the or Truett Seminary's Black Church Studies Program with that with that information that you see in this slide. Uh, but I want to first I want to first of all thank our thank our thank our panelists for their for their time. It's been a it's been a joy. I want to thank my my co my co moderator John 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 Maurer. Uh, and each and every and each and every one of you for watching. God, God bless you, um, and 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 thank you.